Good morning, everybody. Uh, today is our last class of the semester. And I think it's going to be, again, last, uh, similar to the last two weeks. We are not going to spend the whole three hours uh, because uh, convex all in three dimensions, three space, uh, is not very difficult. We are going to see uh, a randomized incremental algorithm um, uh, which can, uh, the analysis of the algorithm is very complex. So I'm not going to go into the analysis, time complexity analysis of the algorithm. Well, the expected running time of the algorithm is going to be n log n. So similar to finding convex solves in two dim dimensions, then you do it in three dimensions, the complexity does not increase. We are going to see that we'll be able to find convex solves in uh, three space uh, in n log n time, n being the number of points. So before uh, we start on convex solves, uh, uh, I also graded your fifth homework, not the programming assignment, the one with the epsilon, because it's, uh, I mean, it took uh, too long for me to grade it. You may confuse as, as soon as you see the graded homework, you may assume it's the last homework. It's the previous one uh, from the last. Uh, so uh, actually, most of the solution, I, I initially, when I read like three or four uh, papers, so homework papers, I thought that there were many different solutions, but the rest of them were very similar to the <laughs> first four. So actually there were two, uh, there, there was a common error uh, most of you have done. So let me remind you the problem. Uh, so we are given a set of two dimensional uh, points with uh, possible, some of them having the same x coordinates. And the goal is to transform this set of points into uh, another set uh, such that no two points are going to have the same x coordinate okay so uh, and uh, the the goal is just for those points with the same x coordinate if we apply a shear transform uh, some of them are going to be i mean the shear transform is going to uh, transform them to the uh, right uh, based on their y coordinates, so a point at, at a higher level is going to be transformed in x direction more. But while we are doing this, uh, we cannot just apply this uh, to only the points to the x coordinates. So this is a global transformation we are going to apply to all the points. And the restriction was while we are doing this, we don't want, for example, a point uh, to uh, change the order of the previous, so this was the previous order, this was one, this was two, for example, in the previous order, we don't want this order to be changed. So in this shear transform, what is the, uh, give us a safe epsilon value that we can use in this shear transform, okay? I mean, even, you cannot say 0 0.1, just pick a small one, 0 0.1, you cannot guarantee 0 0.1 is going to be safe without uh, going through, maybe there, there are points in which 0 0.1 epsilon is going to change their order. Okay, so you cannot, we need to inspect these points to find this epsilon. And uh, the idea is uh, just look at the point, I mean for those points with the same x coordinates, uh, we don't care about their order actually. I mean just uh, because Initially, they were, they were at the same x coordinates. The order was not defined. Or, I mean, the order was defined from uh, smallest y to the uh, highest y, you may say. I mean, if, if they have equal x coordinates, we can order them from smallest to highest y. So, with any epsilon, uh, the order is going to be preserved. Okay? The highest epsilon, even if you, you take any epsilon greater than zero, okay? Uh, this order is still, since this has the smallest y, the medium y, the largest y, it's going to be again in this order for any epsilon greater than zero. Now, the problem is with the, I mean, so in our solution, we, we can ignore uh, points with the same x coordinates. But uh, for the other points, uh, let's look at these two, for example. Uh, if so this is x1, y1, x2, y2, okay, so x2 appears after x1, and in those cases in which uh, y2 is greater than y1, again, we don't need to worry about these cases. Any epsilon greater than zero again will do, because the, the second point, which is supposed to come after, I mean, this x2, our goal, at the, at the end of the shear transform, we, our goal is the transformed x2 should be greater than transformed x1, right? And since y2 is greater than 
uh, y1, uh, in that case, we don't need to worry about, since we are going to transform x2 even, we are going to add a larger number to x2. Okay, so these were the points. So we are going to add a larger number to x2, so x2 prime is going to, uh, is going to be guaranteed to be larger than x1 prime. But there are the problematic cases are when this point here is uh, at a smaller uh, y2 value than uh, this one. So in such cases, uh, the, the value we add to this one due to y1 can, uh, can make x1 prime I can, can violate this entity. But in order to find uh, whether what is the safe epsilon we can add, many of you just did, okay, the difference between x2 minus x1, since I'm adding uh, epsilon times y1 to x1, okay, I just need to compare, I just need to look at this value. Okay, this was the common error. Because uh, what you're not... Uh, Considering this case is that we're also adding y2 to x2. You cannot just look at y1. You need to look at the difference. You need to look at the delta y between these two values to uh, determine that. For example, what if this y2 is a negative number, minus 1,000? <laughs> By just looking at y1, you are going to uh, assume a large, say, epsilon, which is not safe. So your solution is going to be incorrect if y2 is way down below, in, uh, b below zero, for example. So you need, to, you need to consider. So not considering y2 is assuming that the second point is at uh, x, uh, 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 y is equal to zero. Okay? The, the second point may not be at y is equal to zero. Uh, it may be. Uh, so some solutions just assume the points are in the first quadrant. Uh, but there can, can be negative y coordinates. So we need to look at here, the, the thing that we are going to uh, look at is this uh, ratio, okay? Because we are also adding uh, epsilon times y2 to uh, x, uh, x2. Uh, so y2 should also be taken into account. And the, the idea is sort the points first for each consecutive uh, points, uh, look at this ratio and uh, pick the maximum of these uh, ratios as your uh, uh, safest uh, value, okay? Uh, so, uh, I mean, most of you who got 80 uh, was due to this error, not considering delta y, but just looking at one of the one of the y's. I mean, you thought the transformation was going to be applied only on one of the points, but you cannot choose which point. Maybe you are going to apply the same transformation due to the next neighbor of this one. You are not the, the transform uh, the shear transformation is not only applied to this one; it's applied to every point. So, I mean, that's why we are looking for the safety of epsilon. Otherwise, uh, the question would not be uh, meaningful. So this y2 should also be considered. So that was the common error in many uh, paper, ma many, many homework solutions. And one, another common is that, another error was that uh, not, we need to really inspect all the, uh, all the consecutive x intervals. You cannot just pick, so one, one solution was uh, after sorting them, just pick the smallest x interval first without looking at the delta y, okay? Just look at the smallest x interval and, and then uh, look at their delta y values. But the smallest, it can be a case like this, the smallest s x interval without looking at y's at all, okay? So the smallest x interval, let me even make it smaller. Okay, so this is the smallest x interval but they can be very close in terms of their y coordinates, okay? So the, when the epsilon you are going to find using their y values, it may be a large number. I mean, you can have a larger x interval, a larger x interval in which one of the point is here, one of the point is here, which, which is going to, the epsilon you are going to find here, okay, the epsilon is going to be smaller than epsilon one, it may be smaller than epsilon one, which means that epsilon one 
is not going to be safe uh, for this one. Okay, for, for this pair of points, epsilon 1 is not going to be a safe maximum bound because uh, if you do that, uh, you are going to change the orders. If you add epsilon 1 to this one, it may change uh, the order of these points uh, due to that. Okay, so we need to look at the, both delta x and delta y for each consecutive pair of points to, and just pick the uh, maximum of those as our safe uh, epsilon. All right, so any questions about this homework? Okay, so, uh, and also next week we are going to have our uh, final exam. So the final exam is uh, the 13th of Friday at 9.30. Uh, but, I mean, maybe I can post this. I, I, I don't know. Let, let me check. I mean, is it going to be okay for you if I, uh, we start like half an hour late, maybe 9.30, maybe too early for you? So, because the, the, the final exam is not going to be long. So we, we are, uh, they allow to like uh, three hours for our midterm. It's not going to be three hours. So instead of using the first two hours, we can use the last two hours that is allocated for us. Uh, if it's okay for everybody, uh, I can, uh, we can start like one hour late at 9, uh, 10, 10 30. Uh, similar to our starting uh, class. Okay, so I'm going to post an announcement to the news group about this and um, If there are no ob objections, we are going to have our final exam at 1030 okay. And I'm going to also post with that I'm going to post the sections of the book that you are responsible for <laughs> Because we skipped some sections and today we are going to also skip we are, we are Now today we are going to talk about chapter 11 but not the last three sections of chapter 11, we are not going to cover them. So I'm going to uh, post section by section the, 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 the sections from the book that you are responsible in the final exam. All right, any uh, questions about these announcements, final exam, homework? Uh, well, I also noticed that there were um, quite a few students who, s who did not submit the fifth homework. I mean, this epsilon assignment. Uh, I mean, if you think that, just check your grade, and if it's not there, I mean, if maybe, I mean, if maybe, it's maybe, I, I don't think that, I, I hope it's not the case, but I don't want to have lost your <laughs> homework solution. If that's the case, I mean, you can resubmit again, but uh, just, if you really did not submit, I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, the, the, the previous homeworks, I think that this was not uh, harder than uh, the previous four homeworks, but, uh, there are lots of no submissions uh, in the fifth homework. All right, so let's start with convex hulls in three space. And the motivating application in the chapter, so the ch if, you, if you now you're familiar with our textbook, in each uh, start of the textbook, we have a motivating application from real life problems. And at the end, we see that uh, it con if you convert this real life problem to a purely geometric problem, and so most of the time we forget what the real problem was when we get into the geometric problem. And it's a similar case in this chapter as well. Um, the motivating example here uh, is about the, the mix mixture problem, mixing things to get. And let me first uh, follow that example from the book. Okay, so so imagine, uh, for example, you are mining some fluid, fluid from uh, underground. Okay, so you are you are just for you're, you have some wells. Okay, uh, it may be an oil well or it may be something else. But what you, you may have wells in different places uh, in, a, in, a, in a field, for example. And what happens is that each well may have a different proportion of the material that uh, material contained in them. For example, imagine uh, we have a fluid, fluid which contains two types of compounds in it. Okay. Uh, two types of compounds. And in a particular valve, 
uh, the mixture of these two compounds that occurs in naturally in that well, maybe for example 25% of A and for example 15% of B. Okay, and, and the rest 60% uh, may be water, for example. Okay, so it may, but we're not interested in water, we're just interested, these are the, interest, the compounds that we're interested in. So this is uh, in one well, and in another well, what we have here is that for the same, it, we have again the same compounds, okay, uh, A and B, but their amount, I mean their ratio in that may be different. For example, in that one maybe 10% A and 15% B. Okay, so now in this mixture problem, we are asked this, I mean th these ratios if we are going to, uh, in a factory for example, we are going to do some manufacture, manufacturing, uh, these ratios were not, may not be the ratios that we are interested in. For example, we want to have a mixture in which uh, we are going to have, for example, 15% uh, A and, actually let me change this number, <laughs> let me make this 30% or 25% this time, for example. It's not going to be interesting otherwise. Let's make it 20%. Okay, so maybe 15% uh, and 16% uh, B. Okay, uh, now uh, if this is the ratio that you're looking for in the liquid that you are going to have, uh, the question is, is it possible to combine these two different mixtures with different ratios, for example, take two of this, take one of this, uh, to obtain uh, what you're looking for. So the question is, is it possible to do that? And the answer to that is really easy, actually. If, if we have two compounds like this, uh, this, these two, actually, if we represent these as points in 2D space, 25, so this is Okay, so 25, 15, and this is, for example, 10, 20. What we are interested in here, actually, is this ratio. Okay, take this much from this, the ratio, take one unit from this, take two units from this, and combine them, is actually a linear combination of these uh, individual different compounds. And this linear combination, any amount of linear combination from these two. And the important thing here is that uh, we are talking about percentages. For example, take one amount from this, two amount from this. What you are going to get at, at the end is uh, an amount of three units. And two of them is composed of this, one of them is composed of the other. So in total, we are again interested in percentages. I mean, this can be either, I mean, the, the, the search space we are interested in here is that this we can, uh, in the final compound we have, the mixed liquid, uh, this can have 0 to 100 uh, percent uh, in that final uh, mixed liquid, and this can also be 0 and 100 percent in the other one, but uh, these percentages, percentage 1, percentage 2, they should be equal to 100 percent at the end. Okay, so this is, uh, I mean, when you're mixing things but, and you get a final liquid at the end, this is uh, what we have. So we have a linear combination of these individual mixtures, but this linear combination is a restricted linear combination. The percentages, it's, a, it's a, like a weighted average in which the weights sum up to one at the end. So it's not like an arbitrary linear number. So what we get at the end is that if we have a linear combination like that, for example, weight one, mixture one, times weight two, mixture two, okay, and here W1 and W2 is equal to one, okay, and both of them uh, are greater than zero, greater than or equal to zero, and their summation is one. Such a linear combination is also called uh, convex combination, okay, or 
convex sums, something like that. Yeah, convex combination. Such a linear combination in which the weights sum up to one is called convex combination. And uh, any point on this line, I mean, the, the, this equation here is going to give us a, any point uh, on this line. Okay, so if you want to find out whether such a combination is possible by mixing these in different amounts, you just check, you need to check this 15, 16 is on this line, if, on line segment. Okay? It's not the line because we cannot have negative proportion. Put, I mean, you take minus 10% of this A and plus 110% of this. This, is not, this doesn't happen in real life. You cannot extract, uh, uh, you cannot have negative contribution. So the contributions are positive. So uh, any point on this line segment is going to be, uh, uh, the, is going to give us all the possible uh, ratios of A and B we can uh, put together in our manufacturing, uh, in, our, in our factory, for example. And when this becomes, uh, this is well 1, this is well 2, for example, well 1, well 2. Uh, if we have a third well, well 3, okay, with different A and B combinations, what will happen is that we are going to have ourselves a triangle like this, if they are not collinear, and any point within this triangle is going to be a valid uh, combination of these A, A and Bs that we can produce. Okay, so this brings us to the problem, I mean this mixture problem brings us to the convex, the convex optimization, the convex combination uh, is not the, the, it's not a coincidence that uh, we have convex hulls and convex uh, combination, it's very related to the convex hulls. If we have a number of wells like this, uh, in which only there are two compounds in them, if we find after their uh, convex hull, uh, any point in that convex hull is going to be a valid uh, ratio that we can produce. And some of the uh, points were already going to be inside the convex hull, which means that 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 well, you can just close that well. You don't need it because the, whatever you, pro I mean, if, if just for the amount of production, you may need it, but it doesn't provide you anything new. For example, if you have 100 wells open in different places, and some of them, if you just plot these 100 points and find their convex hull and see that some points are inside the convex hull, what does it mean? It means that whatever you, you get from that well, actually you could have produced it by a combination of the wells that are on the convex hull, okay? As the, ver the vertices of the convex hull are going to be the wells that you need for a variety, to, to vary your production. Different, to have different production cap capabilities, the, the points you need are the points on the, uh, the vertices on the convex cells. Any, any, any uh, liquid, any well that you have opened, which, which falls into this convex hull, could be produced by the other ones, okay? As a linear combination, as a convex combination of the other ones. Now, today, uh, we are going to uh, just, I mean, this motivating problem, as you can see, has nothing to do with convex hulls in three space. We are still, I mean, you can solve this problem in convex hulls in two space, or uh, com, uh, two compounds in the liquid, and uh, we, we do convex hulls in 2D space. Uh, the only, uh, the motivating to the convex hulls in three space is that, what if we have uh, three compounds within the same liquid? Okay, now, for example, 25% of this one, or 20% of C. Okay, so uh, if we have uh, three-dimensional, I mean, if we have three compounds within a liquid, then our points become uh, points in three space, in three-dimensional space. And uh, in three-dimensional space, uh, similar to convex hulls, the, the polygons, the convex polygon we compete in 2D, what we have is a, a convex polyhedra, or it's called convex polytope, okay, uh, which is composed of faces, and uh, what we have is a convex uh, sh shape, which is composed of uh, faces. Now, the goal will be to compute this convex polytope given n uh, three-dimensional points. 
Okay, so today we are going to see how can we compute this convex shape uh, given uh, some points in three-dimensional space. We are first going to analyze how, how, the, how does it look, okay? How does the, the convex half of uh, three-dimensional points uh, look like? Uh, it, how does its faces look like? And what's the complexity of the, that convex half? The, the convex polytope. Hmm? Yes. Yes. Exact. For example, in, 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 even if it's if we only have three, uh, since three points lie on a plane, even though the uh, the points are three dimensional, you can solve it by as a two dimensional convex hull problem. Okay. Because uh, you can transform all these points to two dimensional coordinates uh, by after you find the plane they are contained in. Okay, so the, the actually uh, we need, that's a very good observation. I mean, uh, we need at least four points which are not on the same plane uh, and three of them should be on, not, on, not three of should be on different lines. So the minimum uh, convex polytope we are going to have for four points is going to look like a tetrahedron. Okay, so it's going to look like a tetrahedron and it's going to have four points uh, as vertices. And there are other applications, uh, I mean, in addition to these mixing things problem, uh, the con convex hulls in three-dimensional space have other applications as well. For example, one application is in computer graphics, uh, when we have some non-convex objects, complicated uh, non-convex, uh, very complicated non-convex objects in our virtual environment. And uh, in dynamic environments like this, one requirement in computer graphics is to do collision tests, okay? Whether this object collides with uh, another non-convex complex uh, object. And usually if your objects are composed of many triangles, uh, you usually represent these complex objects as triangles and you don't have any other solution than testing all the triangles with respect to each other. And if you have 10,000 triangles uh, for one object, 10,000 triangles in the other object, it means, uh, I mean, 100 million comparison between every triangle. It's very costly. So in computer graphics, we don't do that. Instead, before doing this detail analysis, and there may be thousands of such complex objects in the scene, okay, each of them composed of thousands of triangles, um, and the first thing is to represent them with a more uh, abstract representation with a, like a bounding box or a bounding sphere. Okay, so we, have, we may have a very convex, very complex object. This is not maybe very complex, but we may have a, but this is a non-convex object. Uh, we first represent them by a bounding sphere and all the objects now have their own bounding spheres in our scene. For the intersection test, we first do just sphere intersection, which is much simpler than uh, in trying to uh, see whether these two intersect or not. Okay, intersection of these arbitrary shapes is really difficult. I mean, how are you going to represent them uh, mathematically? Probably there is no representation of this as a function. Uh, what you have is just a, as a set of triangles. You, this is how you represent this, and this is also another set of triangles. If the these sets of triangles their cardinality is very large, uh, what you get yourself. Still, it's a triangle-triangle intersection, which is simple, but you are doing this for many triangles, many triangle pairs, which complicates the problem. But if you represent them as just with bounding spheres, instead of 10,000 by 10,000 comparison, all you need to do is check whether these two spheres intersect or not, okay? Now, uh, first of all, uh, this such, let's think about the bounding sphere intersection. If two objects uh, do intersect, are we sure that their bounding spheres are going to intersect as well? Yes, so it means that such an approach does not have any false negatives, okay? So we are not missing anything. If there, if there is an intersection, uh, if their bounding spheres intersect, uh, we are going to, if there's an intersection, we are going to find, find that. 
We are not missing out anything. So the good, uh, good thing about the bounding spheres approach is that we don't have any false negatives. We are not uh, missing out any real intersections. But uh, the catch is that, okay, uh, so why, wh the catch is that their bounding spheres may intersect, but the objects may not. So in other words, the bounding sphere intersection test may give us some false positives. Okay, so uh, the, 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 for example, in a case like this, their bounding spheres intersect, but these two objects do not intersect. So what we need to do is, in order to get rid of these false positives, what usually uh, we, they, only if their bounding spheres intersect, they perform these detailed tests to see that whether it's a false positive or not. Because the hope, uh, hopefully not many bounding spheres will, will intersect, so instead of, uh, testing for every pair of objects in your scene, you're just making, doing this test for which the bounding spheres are inter, in, intersect with each other. And the number of bounding sphere intersections is usually much less than the number of possible object pairs. Okay, so the false positives are handled like that. And, but uh, if instead of bounding spheres, if we used the convex hull, of this object, this non-convex complex object, this will further reduce the number of false positives. Okay, because I mean, uh, in an object like this, if you have an object like this which is very elongated, uh, the bounding sphere may have, I mean, these empty areas, uh, the larger these empty areas are, the more false positives you are going to get. So your representation, your crude representation here, uh, should be uh, simple enough and should cover, I mean, sh should not have these empty spaces within itself because these empty spaces are safe spots for other objects. That, I mean, the objects that are here are not going to intersect in this object. Uh, so if you want this bound as tight as possible, but uh, still, uh, maintain the simplicity and we can use convex hulls for that purpose the convex hull of this is going to be something like this or maybe you can I mean, you, instead of using spheres using bounding boxes is a better idea I mean, just rectangular uh, prisms you can use a rectangular prism which is going to take care of the, this problem uh, now the book says I mean you, you can use convex hulls as an alternative representation of this uh, abstract representation of convex objects and, uh, and in this, and the book assumes that it's not uh, very difficult to test the intersection of two convex uh, polyhedra. And there are techniques actually uh, which can do this efficiently, making use of the fact that they are convex, we may not need to test the intersection of all the triangles, okay? And the convex polyhedra here can be uh, can have much fewer vertices than the object itself. So by using these efficient techniques that can compare two convex, that, that can uh, test the intersection of two convex polyhedra, uh, we can have, uh, we can increase the efficiency of this uh, algorithm. But it can never be faster than testing two spheres, okay? <laughs> testing two spheres is the easiest case. Okay, uh, so uh, we are increasing our complexity in that regard, but we are reducing false positives. So, uh, I mean, that's reducing false positives is also important because um, for the false positive cases, you conduct a detailed test for the actual complex objects, okay? I mean, if you have uh, intersections, lots of such false positive intersection like this for complex objects, uh, if their bounding spheres intersect, you do a detailed intersection on the actual objects, which is costly. So you don't want the number of false positives to be large. But another solution may be to do a hierarchical case. Maybe don't get rid of bounding spheres entirely, using it uh, in a hierarchical manner. First bounding spheres, then convex polyhedra, and the convex hull, and then the uh, object itself, okay? So uh, this may be uh, another, sh I mean also, so this shows us that the convex hull may also produce false positives. I mean the convex hulls intersecting does not mean that 
the objects do not intersect. It's, uh, in the non-convex regions, there may be no intersections, but the convex cells may intersect. Okay, so uh, today we are going to see, uh, so after this motivating example, we are going to see how we can compute the convex hull of uh, points in three-dimensional uh, space. Any questions up to this point? All right. So we, we said that the minimum, let's, if we look at the convex hull in three dimensions, we need four points in order to uh, have a convex hull. And these four points, they shouldn't, uh, three of them should not be collinear and four of them should not lie on the same plane. Okay, so we can think of it like this. Uh, we can think of a plane. It's sure that three of them lies on this plane, okay? You can just pick any three of them, you can uh, draw the plane that passes through these three points, and they are not collinear, okay? So this is the triangle we have for them. And imagine we have a point above the plane, okay? So this point here is not on the plane, it's somewhere here, it's above the plane. And we also draw triangles to that. So it's going to have one triangle here. So let me actually draw this in dashed line because it's going to be in the background, you're not going to be able to see it. And this is going to be like this. This is going to be like this. So as you can see, it's going to be a shape with four triangles on it. The original triangle on the plane and the three triangles. So you can think of it like this. Uh, we have a triangle on the plane and we have a point uh, here. And from this point, I draw lines, line segments to all the three points, okay? And each of these line segments, they are going to define uh, three triangles in total. So three triangles uh, on top of here and one triangle uh, on the plane is going to be uh, shaped like this, the composed of uh, four triangles. Now, uh, the, the given endpoints, as we can see, the, uh, if you have M points, what is the maximum number of vertices your convex hull is going to have? Any ideas? If you have N vertices, the convex shape you have, I mean, uh, how many vertices uh, can we have at most on this, on this shape? It's trivial, right? <laughs> it's, it's at most n because we don't introduce any new vertices. Our vertices are the points. Uh, just as the convex, uh, two-dimensional two convex uh, hull, uh, our points have become the vertices of the convex polygon. Here, uh, the, num the points, the input points given to us are going to be the vertices uh, of the convex, uh, convex hull the three-dimensional convex hull. So the number of vertices is at most n, but what does it tell about the faces and edges as well? I mean, can you have quadratic number of faces, although you have n uh, vertices? And the answer is no. I mean, the number of faces and the number of edges is again linear uh, in terms of the number of points but the number of faces can be at most like 3n minus 6. Again, we used the Euler's uh, formula for this, and the Euler's formula was first initially proposed like for convex polytopes in three-dimensional space, okay? For convex polytopes, uh, we, can, uh, we can represent them as planar graphs. Uh, we can project them, uh, uh, I mean, we can like unfold them on a two-dimensional planar graph, and in, in such, if we have, we do that, we do that, uh, that, we see that the number of edges is at most 3n minus 6. So 
Uh, this, this comes from the fact that in a convex polyhedra, each vertex is shared by at most three faces. Okay? We cannot have more than three faces that share a vertex, or, or maybe, or maybe no, no, three edges that share a vertex and two faces that share an edge. No, if you have a convex shape, and if you have an, imagine an edge on this convex shape, uh, it's, it's incident to two faces. We cannot have more than two faces incident to the same edge if that face is a convex shape. It may, you may have some interesting shape which is not convex, which share the same edge, but if we, are, if we have a convex polyhedra, uh, an edge is shared by at most two faces. And actually, if it's, uh, it's, since it's closed, I mean, we can, I, can safe, I think we can safely say that each edge is shared by exactly two faces, right? Because then it's going to be, there are going, if there's an edge which is not shared by two faces, there's going to be open, it's not going to be a closed uh, polyhedra. Okay, so I mean, so uh, the convex hull we are going to have is, uh, its complexity is linear in the number of points. Now we are going to see uh, how we can compute the convex cell. Okay, so given uh, this, I'm going to talk about the algorithm, and the algorithm uh, is not going to take too long to describe. We'll first start about the nature of the algorithm. Again, it's going to be a randomized incremental algorithm. And I will be, I actually, I don't like the term randomized that much because uh, any permutation is, is a good permutation for us. So you don't, uh, I mean, start with, you first just randomize your set of points. The, but uh, sometimes this randomization may be useful if your initial input has a specific order of points in, in them, okay? That's why sometimes randomization is important. For example, if your input points has a certain specific order in them, for example, they are sorted in terms of their x, x coordinate, then y coordinate, then z coordinate. Such an order may have a negative effect on our incremental algorithm. Okay, some, maybe it has a positive effect as well. But it may uh, just uh, to, to make sure uh, we just our algorithm works good on a, just a random ordering of these points. So just as a first step, we just randomize the order of these points. So we just take. Uh, we don't, uh, uh, we take the points not sorted in x, y, or z coordinates, okay? So that's why it's called randomized algorithm. And it's called an incremental algorithm because we are going to build our convex hull incrementally by adding each point to an, uh, to, uh, for example, we're just first initial step, we are going to pick four points which are not collinear, which do, do not lie on the same plane. We, we, are, we can pick such four points. Uh, for example, if we cannot pick such four points, it means that all our points are on the same plane, and you can use 2D convex solve to compute their convex solve. So there must be, uh, if there is one uh, point at least not on the same plane, we can pick these four as our initial step, uh, as our first step of the algorithm, and this is going to be our initial convex hull. And so at each iteration of the algorithm, we are going to pick the next point randomly uh, and we are going to update our convex hull and in, is, are, we are going to include this point, uh, we are going to consider this point and enlarge our convex hull. But as you can see, while we are doing this, some points are going to fall inside the current convex hull in that case, we don't need to do anything. So just uh, as, so uh, we need to analyze how many points are going to be uh, in the, uh, so the complexity is going to come from the fact that only for the points that are outside this convex cell, we need to do some things, okay? That's, this is the, uh, the computationally heavy stuff. But if the point is inside the convex cell, we are not going to do anything at all. And uh, the algorithm is really good to determine whether the point is inside or not, we are not going to conduct inside-outside tests for all the polygons. It's, we are going to maintain a data structure called a conflict graph, which is going to do it, or give us whether a point is inside or outside in all one time. Okay, so it's going to be really, uh, really fast. Uh, and at the, 
after we add all the points, after we, in, 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 uh, after we process each of these end points, at the end we are going to have the correct convex hull. This is how the algorithm is going to look like. But before we go into the details of the algorithm, let's have a 10-minute break, and I'm going to uh, describe the algorithm.